So um, I could give you a general overview of my practice, but I'd rather talk about what's happened more recently in the past year or two, um, and in particular uh, about violence, um, which I know isn't great, but um, I think it's something that's definitely affected my practice um, a great deal, and especially the question of how do you escape it? Um, well, I've learned that you can't. Uh, you need to confront it. Um, but how do you confront it without enduring more of it? Um, and there are a lot of narratives around fighting back state violence, police violence, uh, violence against queer and especially trans bodies. And they're often accompanied with images, oh, whoops, uh, with images um, of the very weaponry that's used against us, you know, of the physical gun, <clears throat> excuse me, guns and swords and what have you. Um, but what happens when they retaliate again? Um, and they often retaliate with even more force. Um, and violence has really been a constant theme in my life. Um, um, and, you know, from a very young age, um, I saw it in very close proximity. Um, at the age of six, my father was killed outside of our home in Karachi, Pakistan, by police. Uh, my grandfather was executed in a military coup. My uncle was poisoned and beaten to death uh, by the Pakistani government while on holiday with his family in France. Um, my aunt was shot and killed in a political rally. Um, and, and my family, of course, doesn't want to add another name to that list. So, and neither do I. So then how do I then inherit that history? How do I then um, absorb it, regurgitate it, um, and perhaps even dare I say, learn from it. Um, in Pakistan, I worked with religious communities and sexual, minor sexual minority communities or gender minority communities. But coming to the US, I faced a very grave reality that I was, in fact, a minority. Um, as a queer identifying Muslim, I was coming face to face with the fact that my body was considered threatening. And if I played my cards right, exotic and maybe dangerously desirable. But that was if I was lucky. Um, even liberal San Francisco uh, played host to some of the most intense forms of Islamophobia I've ever seen in my life. Um, for example, these Islamophobic signs on buses and public transport. I don't know if any of you noticed them when they were around. Um, and you can see there's actually a sticker right there. That was one um, that was designed by myself and a Colombian artist and designer, Ana Maria Montenegro. Um, and we designed these as our sort of rebuttal because we not only noticed that, that they were there, we also noticed that people weren't reacting to them. Perhaps the best I saw was someone going, oh, <laughs> and sort of letting the bus pass on. Um, and for me, I mean, that was very, very, you know, scary to see that nobody was really questioning this. Um, and I think one of the reasons why nobody was really questioning this was that because there was an imagination of the Muslim male being violent, an imagination that was so deeply entrenched in this society that even the most liberal of people in this city couldn't escape it. Um, and so, oh, and these are also, we also designed these. Uh, in retaliation to that. In fact, they were sold at, they're being sold, are they, we need more. Okay, we're out. Okay, we'll get more. They were being sold at Dog Eared Books in the Castro. Now they're not, but we're out. Again, this was another co collaboration with the same artist, Ana Maria Montenegro. Uh, this was a mural we did as well. What if, um, what if we kill them before they kill us? Uh, it was the same line just repeated over and over and over again. Um, so I work both in performance and visual work and, um, and multiple other things. Back in Pakistan, I worked a lot with social practice and, um, and that was very important to me at the time. But, you know, my practice changes and I kind of pick up things as I go along. So these were a series of what I call um, preformances uh, that I did as a collaboration with uh, Iranian artist Minur Zomorodinia. Um, and we started in 2014 and it's still ongoing and we finally gave the the performance series, a name called Side by Side. Um, and again, it was in response to the, Isla the, the rampant Islamophobia happening then, you know, happening from when I first uh, touched down in the United States in San Francisco, the city that was so liberal that it couldn't even tear down a sign. Um, and, um, 
And then we continued it even to now. We've gotten funding for it, even though it's literally just 10 minutes of us doing some stretches, kind of. Um, but we've gotten a lot of attention recently, and especially after Trump was elected, um, which at the time was great. It was great to know. As an artist, it's great to have exposure. As a writer, it's great to have exposure. But when that's accompanied with the fact that now suddenly people are listening, it came with this idea of where were you two years ago? Where were you three years ago? Where you, were you 20 years ago? Where were you 50 years ago? Um, so it kind of got us thinking that actually there, it will always be relevant. Um, this kind of work will always be relevant and we'll keep on praying in public spaces. So yeah, as you can see, we just go and pray in public spaces in the city of San Francisco and occasionally we even invite people um, to pray with us. Oh, and also there's this thing in Islam that you can't have a man and a woman pray together. Um, it's not really in the Quran, but it's a, it's a social thing. Um, so we're simultaneously challenging our own communities as well um, to break down these barriers that we have. And that's kind of the point of um, fighting against Islamophobia is that every community has issues. But who are you to tell me what mine are? Um, we have the capacity to think and investigate ourselves. Um, right? Uh, so this performance, Silent Crisis, um, I started as a response to the Pulse Massacre, and I think for many of us in this room, it was a very, very, very heavy weight to bear in some ways. Um, all of us felt that we needed to speak to it. Um, and I remember when I heard the attacker's name, Omar Mateen, a Muslim, um, my heart sank again. Um, and I suddenly felt on the defense that perhaps the small community I did have, I would lose um, all the work queer Muslims were doing and have been doing for the past two decades. Uh, would go down the drain in a matter of seconds. Um, and it became evident that people did not see queers and Muslims as interchangeable as the fact that you could actually be both at the same time. Surprise, surprise. Um, and there was this sense that our Latinx um, and, and black brothers and sisters folks um, and again, you can also be Latinx and black and Muslim at the same time as well. Um, all of those things, actually. Uh, it's great. Identity. Anyway, um, and uh, that we would also lose that solidarity that we were building. I mean, here in San Francisco, you go down the mission and there are, you know, there's a lot of solidarity, especially between Palestinians, Muslim, Christian, um, and the Latinx community that I think has really been... Um, sidelined in a lot of discussions of solidarity and a lot of discussions of political solidarity. Um, so Silent Crisis um, was originally a seven-minute monologue and has now developed into a 20-minute one-person show uh, with video, sound, uh, costume, monologue, of course, and drag. Uh, Faluda Islam is not only my alter ego, she is also my drag alter ego. Uh, and she likes to go around nightclubs in San Francisco and tell people about Islamophobia when they're really just expecting her to dance and lip sync and get off the stage. <clears throat> I still collect tips though. But anyway, so um, here in this performance actually that I collaborate with another artist, Gabriel Christian, um, who's another wonderful performer and constant collaborator. Uh, and this performance is called Father, but Father with a strike through it, like with a slash. It's really hard to tell people. Anyway, but that's what it is. And it recounts the daily experience um, of violence, uh, daily experiences and also memories of violence um, faced by the bodies, specifically of people of color, um, of brown and black bodies. And But really what we were doing is we were trying to resuscitate the memory of my father and his grandmother. Um, and we did an entire performance with the only soundtrack being the cartoons that we watched as kids in our grandparents' and parents' home. Um, and this idea of resurrecting our grandparents or our fathers through ourselves. Um, and I think really, I just want to punctuate that in terms of um, performance, in terms of art in general, I think collaboration is such a huge necessity, um, especially now, especially now when the powers that be I mean, this is so cliche, but they really do want to divide us. They want to make sure, I think, that, um, that as, as diverse as we are and as different as our experiences are to each other, um, that perhaps we will never be able to find a common ground. Um, and I think especially collaboration within arts, within creativity, really helps us 
talk and discuss and create and really find where those links are. Um, anything else I wanted to say? Cool. Now, this is my visual work. Um, I work a lot with fabrics. Um, I call them quilts. A lot of people don't. And I totally respect that because this is a medium that is, you know, very old and needs a lot of respect. But this series is called Musulman Musulmen. And it's, uh, Musulman is, actually it's the same in Spanish, I think, Musulmana, right, for Muslim. Mm -hmm. uh, Musulman is the Arabic word also for Muslim. Um, but it's a pun also on the word like muscle man. Um, and um, I found this book in a market in Lahore in Pakistan and it was an entire book of, um, an entire exercise book written by Arnold Schwarzenegger, translated into Urdu. And I thought this was really amazing because not only was it translated into Urdu, it had great full length pictures, um, which I could really play with. And I had this book for about two or three years and I was like, what do I do with this? And then suddenly one day I picked up a needle and thread and started doing embroidery. Um, and then I started embroidering this book and I started taking out, that's, that's Arnold over there. Uh, I started taking out uh, portions of their body or placing over them portions of their body. Someone referred to it as flaying. Uh, and perhaps, yes, it is flaying. But in a sense, trying to reimagine another type of masculinity. Um, and why this book? Because I thought it was such an interesting in-between space. It was, a, it was a space of translation, which I think is a space that I find myself constantly in, um, even, though my, even though I speak English. But it's still, you know, there's a translation of our mind, there's a translation of our imagination, there's a translation of, um, of interactions. And I thought it was very interesting to be able to create a new form of masculinity, one that suited me best, um, already in this zone of translation, already in this in-between space um, where you're kind of neither here nor there. And I, I really, I don't, you know, I kind of, hate's a strong word, but I kind of hate this sort of, there's these, these conversations around like East and West and like are the East and West colliding and, and I mean this is very much a narrative that, anyway, don't want to mention his name, but anyway, this is very much a narrative that's very much espoused, even in positive ways, it's always about the East and the West, whereas this is neither, this is sort of its own making, these are white male bodies. Um, but with this Urdu script, and again, it, it, it plays with that imagination of, of, of with the Urdu script being like the Arabic script, and then you see these images of these muscly men, the mind is confused, I think. When, they, when you don't understand what it says, y you know, the Arabic script suddenly becomes less threatening, or perhaps maybe it's even more threatening, I don't know, I'll let you decide that. Um, here's another one, just to... Um, I just want to end with that one, actually. I'm pretty much done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.